That's Luke chapter 1 and uh, verse number 5. So <clears throat> this is a very exciting time in the life of the nation of Israel. Uh, the young uh, Jewish virgins, uh, they're all hoping they're the one chosen by God uh, to... Uh, to bear uh, the uh, only begotten Son of God, the promised Messiah. And uh, Israel knows that uh, the time has come for his arrival. God has been silent for 400 years. Those are called the silent years. <clears throat> They've had no prophecy, no revelation, uh, and... Uh, but that's all going to change. Now, notice in verse number five, there was in the days of Herod, king of the, uh, the king of Judea, really a puppet uh, politician of Rome, uh, there, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, or in the Old Testament, Abijah, who was a priest in uh, David, King David's uh, time, <clears throat> and uh, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, let's let's meet Herod. Uh, let's take a few moments and uh, let's get acquainted with Her <clears throat> Herod. And we'll, from the Bible, is where we'll. Uh, take our introduction. I'm going to uh, mark my place in Luke, but I'm going to Matthew chapter number uh, 14. Matthew chapter number 14. And this will give us a little character sketch of Herod. <clears throat> this is God's window into, uh, uh, really, into the heart of Herod. So I'm in Matthew 14, verse 3, for Herod had laid hold on John. And John is, uh, is the forerunner of Christ and, uh, and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Interesting, isn't it? For John said unto him, that is said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have her. And so John <clears throat> um, I believe uh, is attempting to reach Herod. And not just Herod, but Herodias, with the truth of God's word. I don't think John is being hateful. I don't think that, uh, or excuse, that yeah, John uh, here, John uh, the Baptist. Um, I don't think that he's uh, uh, attempting to take God's place and be judgmental. I, I just believe that John a preacher of the word of God is uh, attempting to, uh, to reach Herod uh, and uh, to accomplish that <clears throat> uh, by, uh, by uh, the word of God. And so, so uh, now we see the response of Herod to, to John reaching out to him. Uh, and when he would have put him to death, Herod that is, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. And John is a prophet. He was, uh, he was the last prophet until Jesus, uh, and after that the kingdom of God is preached. Uh, but when Herod's birthday was kept, 
the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Uh, so the, the whole issue here is that Herod has entered into an adulterous relationship with his brother's wife. <clears throat> now, verse 7, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. That is, I believe that to be the young woman that's dancing. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. It's like on a platter. Serve his head up to me. You know, um, this reminds us that, uh, that while some people, upon hearing the word of God and uh, meeting the love of God and the... Uh, the convicting power of God, the, um, some people will repent of their sins and will turn from their sins and even uh, uh, believe in Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls. Some will. But that's not the case here. Uh, we're also finding quite a different response to the word of God and, and the response uh, to uh, God's word, and really, it is a response to God's word because uh, all that John the Baptist has done is preach the word of God. And so the response is to kill the messenger. And uh, so upon hearing that request, verse 9, the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, because he gave his word. And, uh, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, to the dancer, the head of John the Baptist. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And verse 11, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. Now this is, Her this is meet Herod, meet Herod. <laughs> this is that very one in the same Herod that is mentioned in the gospel of Luke. Uh, so they, they murdered the man of God because he cared enough. He cared enough about them to tell them the truth uh, in the hope that they would repent and turn uh, from their sins unto God by believing in Jesus Christ. And that's, uh, that's the message of the forerunner of Christ. And that they would repent and be forgiven of their sins, be saved from hell. And, uh, but uh, that's, not, uh, that's not at all what their response was. Now, um, look, at, uh, look at this in Proverbs 29. So uh, all that to say this, Herod is an evil man. Uh, he's an immoral man. He's certainly an ungodly man. And yes, he's a wicked man. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, he's in charge. He is Rome's, uh, puppet in the land of Israel at the time of the, uh, coming of Messiah. Now notice in, uh, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number two. Because this, this gives us a window into the, uh, into the climate 
uh, the emotional climate of Israel at the time of Herod's rule and, and look at it. Uh, when the righteous are in authority, the people do what, church? They rejoice. Yes. Because when the righteous are in control, the blessings of God are upon the nation, you see. And that's a biblical principle. But in the, in the case of Herod, he's not righteous. He's unrighteous. Uh, and, uh, and, but yet he's in control. But when the wicked beareth rule, what do the people do when the wicked beareth rule? They mourn. The people mourn. Uh, and uh, so uh, when, the, when the wicked beareth rule in a nation, there's a lot of complaining. There's a lot of murmuring. Um, there's a lot of dissatisfaction when the wicked bear rule. Um, uh, and, you know, in fact, uh, uh, their popularity uh, among the people it really goes down. You, you, you might even say that when the wicked bear rule, um, their, uh, their uh, statistics uh, really head south, you know, as far as uh, their popularity vote. Their approval rating, I guess that's what we call it today. Their approval rating is through the floor. And so that just gives you a window into um, what that whole emotional climate was like at, uh, at this time. But there's more about Herod recorded for us uh, about this man that is ruling, that's in control at the time of these uh, awesome, wonderful events that are, uh, that are coming upon the nation Israel. Um, and... Quite honestly, it's, uh, I, I don't know that it's ever been a darker time in the nation than it is under Herod's wicked, evil, tyrannical rule. Notice in uh, Matthew chapter 2, and let's, let's uh, learn a little bit more about Herod. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter number 2 <clears throat> and verse... Uh, Wow, Matthew chapter 2, verse number 16, uh, 17, and 18. All right, uh, Matthew 2, verse number 16. Then Herod, uh, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, now remember the wise men came from Babylon, and the reason the wise men knew about Messiah, the, the coming of Messiah, is because hundreds of year, years before the birth of Jesus, Daniel had been preaching God's word in Babylon. And uh, because of Daniel's faithfulness to witness uh, for God, it, then they knew to watch for the star, that heavenly sign. And they had learned all that from the prophet Daniel, and uh, and so they, and so they, uh, they were being led or being guided by that star uh, unto unto uh, Jesus, uh, the baby at that time, and uh, they met with uh, they met with Herod, encountered Herod, and that's where we pick this up in verse sixteen. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, because remember, Herod said, now when you find Jesus, you come back and tell me so that I may, I may go and you know, worship him. Uh, well, God said to the wise men, don't go back to Herod. You just circumvent him and you, you just don't even, you know, don't tell Herod anything. So, so when Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth and sent forth, here again, let's meet Herod, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, you know, uh, from two years old and under. 
including, mind you, including those who had not yet been born. They were thrust through. The, the expectant mothers were thrust through with the swords of those soldiers who had been ordered by Herod. It, it's officially termed the slaughter of the innocents. Perhaps you've heard that term. And this was all perpetrated by Herod and ultimately by Satan, who is, is uh, working behind the scenes uh, to stop God's great plan of salvation, which uh, we were just blessed in the previous hour to hear the wonderful details of God's uh, of God's uh, of his uh, salvation. And uh, so, boy, there's a lot happening here. And, uh, and so he sent forth and slew all the children uh, in all the areas around Bethlehem from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Uh, verse 17, then was fulfilled. Now that event was a fulfillment of what God had given Jer Jeremiah, the prophet, uh, saying, in, in, notice in verse 18, in Ramah uh, there was a, there, uh, there a voice, there was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel, yeah, Israel, weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. They've all been slaughtered because Herod was not about to allow anyone to challenge his throne, his authority. And so this was his tactic uh, to answer uh, what he considered to be a threat to his throne, his rule. Uh, Isaiah chapter 49, and I just want you to look at one verse there, verse number 15 of Isaiah <coughs> chapter number 49. And uh, just this one verse. And that would be verse number 15. So Israel would not be comforted <clears throat> and uh, can, can a woman forget her, her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And it's very important. I want you to notice this. The child, the child is referred to as a son of her womb. What's that mean? What does that mean? It means life begins before birth. That's what it means. At the moment of conception, that baby is a person, be it man be it boy, girl, man, or woman. It's the sacredness of life which begins before birth. You see? And uh, there's a lot in the news right now I'm noticing uh, in uh, a, uh, what could be, very well could end up being a landmark case about when life begins in our nation right now. To be decided not until next June, I believe it is, but uh, the arguments and the, and, the, and the battle is raging right now. And uh, so it's, uh, is, isn't, it, isn't it interesting that people really haven't changed, but neither has God. Um, Yea, they may forget, but God says, yet will I not forget thee. 
Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's find our way back then to Luke chapter number 1. And uh, And so we've met Herod from the pages of God's word. Uh, we know that the nation is mourning. They're mourning because they have an, uh, 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 a wicked, evil man ruling over their nation. And uh, they're paying a price. We know the nation is mourning because uh, uh, in Bethlehem and uh, the surrounding areas of Bethlehem, uh, the uh, uh, two years old and under have been slaughtered. Uh, as ordered by Herod, and so this is just a very, very, a very terrible time for uh, the nation of Israel. And uh, uh, but uh, but then in uh, verse, we're also introduced to a couple, uh, Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. And uh, but you know. Look at this in contrast to the wickedness. I want you to see uh, there's righteousness. I want you to see uh, that uh, uh, under the shadow of all of that evil, uh, there, there are people who are uh, purposing to honor and glorify uh, their God and their Savior. And uh, so... Verse number six says, and they were both righteous. They were both righteous. And, and uh, tucked into the word righteous are three words that are very definitive. And they are the words innocent, faultless, and guiltless. And we heard about that in the previous hour. Amen. Uh, they, and notice, uh, righteous before God. Now, God sees everything. God knows everything. God hears everything. But when God looks at Elizabeth and, or Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, uh, God sees them as righteous. How is that even possible? Well, because... Uh, when God, the Heavenly Father, looks at this man and his wife, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus, whom this couple has come to believe in, to trust in for the salvation of their souls, the forgiveness of their sins, they are so thoroughly, completely cleansed that all God sees is righteousness. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then watch this as a consequence of, of them being in Christ. Their entire life has been affected in a wonderful way. See what the Bible says walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. What's that next word? Blameless. And so we see their new life in Christ. And really, what a powerful picture of victorious living in Christ Jesus. Doesn't say they're sinless, um, but that's how God sees them in Christ and through Christ and because of Jesus. Uh, but the Bible says they are blameless, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of, of the Lord. Now, uh, look at this in Hebrews. It just help you to, you know, mark, mark your place there in Luke, but... Uh, Hebrews um, chapter 10, I, I know of no uh, uh, 
better place in Scripture to show you how God the Father sees this couple. Uh, and, uh, and it's all because of Jesus. Uh, notice in Hebrews chapter 10, we'll look at just three verses. Uh, verse 12, 14, and 17, verse 12. Uh, but this man, referring to Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And then verse 14, For by one offering he hath, what has he done by his one offering? Do you see that word? Perfected. This is our standing in Christ. It's only because of Jesus. We're perfected. And how long? Are we perfected for forever? Them that are sanctified, set apart for God as a result of, of believing in Jesus Christ. And then uh, verse, look at verse 17. If that weren't enough, look at verse 17. The Heavenly Father goes on to say, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. It's all because of Jesus. Only because of Jesus. And so uh, their, uh, their faith, their belief, their acceptance of Jesus, their repentance, this is their standing in Christ. It's, uh, uh, they're blameless uh, and they're walking uh, in all the commandments, ordinances of the Lord. And it's really uh, that new creation in Christ Jesus uh, that's uh, only possible when he comes in. I want, you to, I want you to see their motives here, their hearts, as it concerns their walk, their walk. And uh, Jesus speaks to that in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and so uh, not too far from where you are, John 14. And, uh, and verse, it, because we've met Herod, and that was, <laughs> you know, that was a dose of reality, but, but we need to meet this couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And uh, we need to, we, you know, we need to see as it concerns walking in the commandments of God, we need to see what's happening in their hearts. And, and really that becomes why are they, why is their walk such that they're blameless? Uh, John 14 and verse number 21, and I'll read through verse 24. Uh, he that hath, Jesus speaking now, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, it's another word for obeys them, Jesus says, he it is that loveth me. So from that, we may conclude rightfully so that Zacharias and Elizabeth love Jesus. That's, that is such a such powerful um, and, you know, uh, truth there. They love Jesus. And he, that, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Promised blessings from Jesus unto those that love him. And er, Judas saith unto him, unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Um, something marvelous happens after we get saved that is so in contrast to the way we are before we're saved. Before we're saved, uh, we love ourselves. But only after our, we are saved... Uh, is it then possible to love Jesus 
and to die unto self and self-will and to be set free from sin. And that's what's happened in their hearts, in their lives. And so, uh, uh, and he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And uh, verse 24, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings and the word which ye hear is is uh, not mine but the father's which sent me so boy there's a lot there's a lot there look at first john chapter 2 it really is uh, after um <sighs> It really does come back to the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And um, for those that are looking for a definitive statement of life, there it is. It's about loving him. And you know what? That's where the blessings, that's where the blessings are in loving him him. Um, look at uh, 1 John 2 and verse number 6. Uh, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Uh, that referring to the walk of Jesus Christ. And then consider these words of Jesus uh, in uh, John chapter 8. Now that's the gospel of John chapter number eight. So, you know, what we're trying to understand is God, his, his declaration of them being blameless, it, it goes right to the heart of the matter, and that's their motive, and their motive, what was driving them was not religion, was not legalism, was not the law, what was driving them and motivating them beyond their repentance and uh, their acceptance of Jesus was the fact that they fell in love with him. They just fell in love with him. Someone said to know him is to love him. You see, and, and so it just wasn't a problem for Zacharias and Elizabeth to live uh, a life of obedience that God uh, defines as blameless. Um, and, and we know that's only because of Jesus Christ in their lives. Uh, it just wasn't a problem for them because they, they were in love with their Messiah. And how Christ-like is that? Now watch this in John 8 and verse number 29. And uh, and. Uh, he that sent me is with me, Jesus speaking. The Father hath not left me alone. Now watch this. So he's talking about that, that fellowship that he, that he had with his heavenly Father. And explain, he explains, for I do always those things that please him. Now, that, that's the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus. So, all that to say this, uh, we find a couple in stark contrast to Herod. Um, we find a couple that is in love with Jesus. <laughs> they're, they're blameless in the sight of God because they've accepted Jesus, believed in Jesus, and, uh, and they walk in obedience because they love Jesus, you see? And what a model that is for the child of God still today. And um, did you know, did you know uh, there are people that just want to be loved? Are you aware of that? They just want to be loved. Do you know that's all Jesus wants? He just wants 
to be loved. And uh, <coughs> and then um, let me show you a wonderful benefit of of um, having this kind of a heart for for the Lord in First John three. It's it's important. This is really important. Um, in First John chapter number three. And uh, in verse number 22, now what? as it concerns um, the benefit, the blessing of loving God and keeping his commandments, which, by the way, is for your own good, <laughs> um, I, I, I will tell you, I'll just tell you and, and uh, say to you that uh, the worst problems I've had in my life are the result of disobeying God. I'm just, I'm just going to be honest with you. And um, the, the greatest blessings of my life uh, have all resulted from obedience to God. See? So, you know, uh, God just wants us to love him and obey him and obey him because we love him, you know, uh, <clears throat> and not obey him because we're trying to work our way to heaven, but obey him because we're already going to heaven. There's a difference. And, and, and he, he, you know, he wants us to do that because that really is, um, it really is the pathway to his greatest blessings upon our lives during our earthly sojourn, our pilgrimage, until we get to heaven. Now, we're going to heaven not because of anything we've done. Uh, we're going because of everything Jesus has finished. And when it's finished, there's nothing left to be done uh, but to, to repent and to, uh, to receive uh, Jesus Christ. Mm. So <clears throat> look at this now, if you would, in uh, <clears throat> 1 John 3 and verse number 22. And whatsoever we ask, so this, this comes to our prayer life, our prayer life. We receive of him because we do what, church? Can you believe that? The importance of keeping his commandments? Here is a promise of answered prayer that is related to loving God and keeping his commandments. And, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Uh, that's what Jesus did. I do always those things that are pleasing in his sight. So... Uh, to live life this way, then, uh, is to be like Christ. And, of course, verse 23, the most important commandment as it concerns the lost. And, and this is his, com his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. And love one another. As he gave us commandment. If you want to know what um, I believe God will use to build his church, uh, I believe it's uh, right there. I just believe people want to be loved. And I believe that people desperately need to meet with the unconditional love of God. And, and when they find that in God's local New Testament church, they'll be responsive. Um, so, wow, let's go back to Luke chapter number one. There's just a lot tucked in here. And 
So, um, <clears throat> now, um, interestingly enough, in verse number seven, now, this part of Luke chapter one, the, the part we're looking at today, is still um, concerning, it's concerning the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist. Okay, we're just, we're, we're still not done with John the Baptist here, who led the way uh, to the coming of, of Jesus. Um, but so we're looking at the parents, the mother, the father of John the Baptist. And uh, I mean, so um, can, you, can you imagine being raised in a home like this? I mean, can you imagine the impact and the power and the effect this all had on John the Baptist as he grew up with parents like these are? Now, what are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is, as he grew up and he came to the age of reason and understanding and being able to comprehend, he realized my parents are real. They're real. They, they don't preach one message at me. And then when they think I'm not looking or I'm not listening, they live some other kind of a message. My mom and dad are real. They showed their son the reality of biblical, a biblical personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and I, what I think they did is they fostered a relationship in the heart of their son. They, I, I think the effect it had is they made John the Baptist hungry for what they had. I mean, you want a lesson, you want an example on biblical parenting? Look at this man and his wife. Wow, what a what a home, what a family, what a what a life to be shaped and molded. In, I mean, and I mean, <clears throat> you know, now look at verse seven and concerning Elizabeth and or uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, <clears throat> they had no child. <laughs> that is a significant statement. They had no child. And it's like, are you kidding me? Because that Elizabeth was, was what? Church? Which means when you're barren, you can't have a child. You can't have a child because you're barren. But not only that, and the Bible goes on to say, they both were now what? <clears throat> And the language there, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the important message there is, not only did they not have a child, not only is this godly woman barren, and now you, know, you have to understand the significance of that in the Hebrew culture. This is the way they looked at it. If a woman could not conceive and bear a child, she was considered cursed by God. In other words, the whole community would, um, <clears throat> you know, would uh, there would be all of these uh, conversations about, you know, about Elizabeth. I wonder why Elizabeth. I wonder. I wonder what Elizabeth did that has invited God's curse upon her life. Maybe she was faithful to her husband and. 
Maybe she's just, uh, you know, a put on. Maybe, maybe she's just a player in terms of, of uh, what we have always considered as far as godliness and obedience and faith. And I mean, there's got to be, Elizabeth has done something. She's done something against God. I mean, you know, this is, this is the social environment that Elizabeth endured as, as a, 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 you know, uh, because she is barren. And now uh, they're, they're well stricken in years. That means now they're too old to have children. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And here's why I say that, because as I go back to um, another promise of God, which is in, uh, uh, would, you, would you look at it with me in Psalm 128? Now mark your place, we'll come right back here, but Psalm 128. This is another promise of God. And, and I assure you, Eliz uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, not only do they know this promise, they have claimed this promise. There it is. Do you see it in a, a Psalm 128? Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Now I ask you, did we not <clears throat> learn from God's word that they walk in his ways? They walk in his ways. Now look at this in verse number two. Now they knew this promise. They were, <clears throat> they were well acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be and it shall be well with thee. That's, that's a blessed life. That's God's blessing upon your life. But look at verse number three. Look what God says. Look what God says to this man. But not just to the, to the man, to his wife. Thy wife, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy what? Thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table. I'm telling you, Zechariah knew this promise, and so did his wife. Now, here's what's remarkable to me about Zechariah and Elizabeth. In their entire ministry life, despite, despite this promise not being fulfilled in their lives, they stayed faithful to God. Are you saying what I'm saying? <laughs> See, what, what is the point? Well, the point is this. Unlike so many, they were not involved with God because they wanted to use God. They were involved with God. Because they loved him. They were not utilitarian. It was not, well, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. God, give me this and I'll give you that. See, that's the shallowness of the relationship that most have with God. I mean, what was driving them? What was in their heart that would keep them faithful? 
for their whole life as servants of God. What's the driving force? They loved. They loved God. And if you're looking for a definition of love, that's a pretty good definition. Isn't that what well, isn't that what true Bible love does? Isn't isn't that what God did for God so loved that he took? Oh, no, that's not what the Bible says. For God so loved that he gave. That's the way love works. It's so incredible to me. It really is. You know, it wasn't, okay, God, I'll do this for you if you'll do this for me. It was, God, I'll do this for you because of who you are. Because you are worthy. Ah, there's a lot there. So um, they had no child. Um. But you know what? The Bible says all things work together for good. To them that, can you finish it? To them that do what? To them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So was their faith, was their faith being tried? Was their faith being tested? Oh, I absolutely, yes, yes, every single day. And I believe the enemy, uh, like he so often does, would have come to them and spoken his lie to them uh, that uh, God doesn't keep his word. God doesn't keep his promises. Why are you even serving God? Why are you giving to God? Why are you wasting your life on God? You see, you've You've spent a whole life. The most precious thing you have, your, your whole life on God, and you're childless. <clears throat> Look at um, Psalm 69 and verse number 3. Uh, but we don't find them quitting. We don't find them giving up. We don't find them defeated. And that's because they never set themselves up to be any of, of those, of those uh, disastrous emotions. And the reason they, they never set themselves up in that way is because it all comes back to their heart's motive. The, the only reason, I'm convinced of it, for why they were doing what they were doing uh, regarding the call of God upon their lives, and, and I, I believe this, the only reason is they just love God. And that, and that begs the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? But if I'm going to be asked that question, then the same question applies to you. Why are you doing, in Jesus' name, whatever it is you're doing? It might be... Uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Mullen's uh, compliments about the beautiful decorations. Why did you do that? I, I appreciate... Those who clean. Why are you doing that? I, I appreciate those who go out door knocking and endeavoring to share the good news. Why are you doing that? I mean, you know, those who mow the 
church field which has a thousand and one weeds in it. Why are you doing that? You know, it's just on and on it goes. Why? It begs the question, why? You see, the point is, if your motivation is anything other than I love him, you're setting yourself up. You're setting yourself up for discouragement, for defeat. And... Uh, but this couple, they did not do that. But look at this. In, um, <clears throat> it's um, Psalm 69 and, and verse number 3. So I'll try to get myself there, please. Uh, and uh, when I tell you I'm thankful for your prayers uh, that I could uh, bring this message, I really am thankful. Psalm uh, 69 and verse number 3. Uh, the psalmist, look at, uh, he said, um, you know, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I do what? While I wait for my God. Hey, you know what that, what he's telling us is, here's a couple that has waited all of their lives for God to fulfill his promise. And they're not wrong. They're not wrong for having expectancy. It's right for us to expect God to fulfill his promises. But what the psalmist is saying to us is it's not easy to wait on God. Is there something that you're waiting on God about? Not easy to wait on God, is it? <clears throat> Are you ever tempted to think it's just never going to happen? It's just not. When you come to those thoughts, you are flirting with defeat. You need to understand, that's the point at which you're ready to throw in the white towel, quit and give up on God. And that's just where the enemy wants you. Not easy to wait on God. Look at uh, Psalm uh, 37, verse 4. <clears throat> Another great promise of God, Psalm 37, in verse number 4. A delight thyself, and I, I, you know, I believe that uh, that's what Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall do what? Now, wait a minute, preacher. You know, wait a minute. How do you know they even desire a child? How do you know they even want a child? Go back to Luke chapter 1. And we'll address that question, Luke chapter 1. As we drop down to verse 11, please, of Luke chapter 1, verse 11. Anyway, so Zechariah uh, goes into the... the, uh, the the house of God into the into the temple of God uh, to uh, to render his priestly uh, ministry, which is to burn incense, uh, and the smoke of the incense rises, and it's a picture. It, in it was that smoke rises, it's it's a very visible illustration from God about how the prayers of God's people ascend up to God uh, and uh, it's called incense in verse 11 do you see it and the word incense in the Greek means uh, a sweet smell it's a beautiful fragrance to God when you whenever you talk to him uh, by prayer it's just just beautiful to him and and it's, it's a sweet smell to him because everything passes through Jesus. And as it passes through Jesus, it's, oh, God just loves it. But when it's, you know, uh, now the, when the wicked pray, God doesn't even hear them. Uh, other than he will hear 
the wicked's prayer of repentance and their acceptance of Jesus Christ. That's the only prayer he'll hear of the wicked, that he'll bless and honor. And then, of course, uh, so Zechariah is now in the temple. He's, uh, he's uh, burning that incense. And while he's in the temple, verse 10 tells us the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So you have, I don't know, God only knows. He doesn't tell us exactly how many people, the, the whole community. Uh, but they're all praying, and and, uh, and and the incense going up, the, the smoke from the incense is a visible reminder to the people that my prayers are ascending to God. And uh, so uh, when, uh, look at this in verse 12 and 1. Uh, the silence is broken. Um, in verse 11, pardon me, uh, there appeared unto him, unto Zechariah's, now he's in the temple. An angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. It has been 400 years since anything like this has happened in the nation of Israel. This is the first time in 400 years God, beyond the recorded scriptures, the inspired scriptures of the Old Testament will now give this communication to the people. And uh, when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. You know, if God wanted to, he could do this today. God wanted to, if he wanted to. Um, and um, but uh, look at this in verse 13 but the angel said unto him fear not Zacharias now look at this look at this For thy prayer is heard. And thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. Wow. I am so glad. This man and his wife did not quit God because God didn't do what they thought God should do, when they thought God should do it, how God, how they thought God should do it. They just stayed faithful to God. And you know what the great message for me and for you is from this? Just stay faithful to God. Day unto day, week unto week, month unto month, year unto year. And this is not the first time, Zacharias. has begged God for a child. Now had they quit, and I'm sure the devil filled their mind with lies, had they quit, and they had the free moral agency to do so, we all do, that's the way God made us, had they quit, and had they walked away from God because they were mad at God, because they couldn't get from God what they wanted from God when they wanted it. So God, I'm mad at you. I'm done with you. They would have missed this blessing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, 
And the thing you want to understand about God is when God does something, He does it in a way that magnifies His honor and glory. I mean, who but God could do something like this? They're past the age of childbearing. She's barren. They're too old to have children. And the way God does this, it exalts Him who alone is worthy. And all they did is just stay faithful to God. I'm wondering, will you just stay faithful to God even when you're not getting from God what you've been asking God for? You're not getting what you're asking God for when you want it? Did you? God is watching this for all of these years, all of these decades. They just keep serving me. I hear their prayers, but I've not answered this prayer. And they just stay faithful to me. In all of these decades, can you imagine the message they're communicating to God? And you know the conclusion that God is coming to from their lives? And there's God and He's, they love me. They just love me. Somebody that's not trying to just use me. Somebody whose prayer goes beyond give me, give me, give me. They love me. What's it mean when a man or a woman turns their back on God and quits and walks away? What message does that send to God? Well, I know the message that their life sent to God. And God is blessed forevermore because a man and his wife came into a personal relationship with God by way of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And they fell in love with Jesus. And their life is a beautiful story of what it means to love God. Not because of what you can get from God, but because of who He is. And God is blessed. God is so blessed. And what honor will be bestowed upon them? They are to be the parents of the very man that they will raise up to become the announcer of the arrival of God incarnate, Jesus Christ. That honor will be bestowed upon them and their son, John the Baptist, to announce that God has come in the flesh, the Savior of the world has arrived. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. The name John means grace. John will be the last prophet. And after that, the kingdom of God shall be preached and the message is grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace. For by grace are ye saved apart from anything that you can do. It's all Jesus. Father in heaven, Lord, I'm so thankful that uh, you have uh, given us so much. I'm thankful for what you've given me this Lord's Day. And I'm thankful for these timeless and still relevant truths Ah, they all apply to our lives. I'm thankful for the example of a man and woman who had to live under the scrutiny of the slander and the gossip of others who had judged them And they just kept loving you and serving you and giving their lives to you because of who you are. Because in their heart, they believe you're worthy. You're worthy of the most precious gift that they had and, or that we have, and that is the gift of our lives away to you according to your will for our lives regardless of what you give us or don't give us it's not about things it's about it's about you and uh, father these are just priceless lessons from your word and Somehow, by your word, I pray you'll encourage us all, help us all, especially those of us that, that are aching for you to do something in our life. We've talked to you about it. We cry out to you about it. We beg you for it. But for whatever the reason, you just tell us to wait. God, I pray you to help us to uh, follow this example of this man and his wife. And even when many would say all hope is lost, it's not going to happen. It's too late. They stayed faithful. And you did what only you can do, and that is you did the impossible. And we know you can do the same for us. Father, bless your word, I pray. And I think especially of those who are trying to work their way, earn their way to heaven. Huh. Well, the way has been paid by Jesus Christ. The only thing left to do is to repent. To acknowledge our, our sins to you. To turn from a life of living in sin against you and to accept you, Jesus, to believe in you, to invite you to come into our life, to forgive us of our sins because you died for our sins, you paid for our sins, and the only thing left to do is to accept Jesus, to be forgiven, to be saved, to be saved from hell, to live the most blessed life on earth that a person can live, just knowing Jesus. Father, bless your word as we stand, as the, your invitation is extended. In Jesus' name, we pray.